All right, good morning to all the brave souls that managed to make it here. <laughs> There's one lesson about going out is making the first appointment of the next day. So I got that one check, check, checked out, so <laughs> we're off. Hi, I'm Ian. I don't have a fancy intro slide. Uh, I do security, have been doing that for a long time. If you're really interested in what I do, just Google it. Yeah, so I saved you, I saved you a slide. You can thank me later, or buy me a beer. Um, what I've been doing in the past, uh, I would say, four or five years on a very commercial basis is red teaming, which really pisses me off because a lot of people are abusing that term tremendously. Uh, so, so I made the slide deck, <laughs> and. Uh, and I'm here to present it. So first of all, just to set things straight so we don't get confused, and if this, this confuses you, again, there's, a, there's another talk in the strip club downstairs. Probably more entertaining than this. What's a red team? Uh, it is not glorified penetration testing. Okay, I'm sorry. It's just not pen testing. Uh, if someone tries to sell your red team and is trying to explain it in pen testing ways and at the end of the day you find yourself looking at a scope that, very, that looks like a pen test, that's not red teaming. Uh, what it is, is a full adversarial simulation. So whatever an actual attacker would do, that is a red team. And that entails, by default, by definition, that there is no scope, okay? So that automatically crosses out any kind of pen testing, which is, by definition, limited by scope. Uh, and that full scope entails everything. Again, it's physical, it's social, it's electronic, and if you've, if you've seen Nickerson's talk yesterday, and you should have, and if you haven't, go and see it and then come back, we'll, we'll just wait for you. Um, we're talking about the main three elements or domains of, of adversarial uh, uh, simulation. Oh, God, my slides suck here. That's, when, that's what they talk about when they say speaker prep, right? I'm losing half of my screen. Let's see if this is better. Holy shit. Nope, still sucks. Bear with me. I just don't want you to lose all of the fancy slides I made for you. We're back. So when we talk about red team, we talk about the three main domains, which are electronic, physical, and social. Right? And the red team is really the convergence of those domains. And again, Chris's talk yesterday kind of focused on the different areas of convergence, where we combine elements from the physical world and the social world, from the social and digital, digital and physical. And red team is really that little piece that connects everything together which simulates what a, a real attacker would do. Um, and again, it's all about the actual fight. And I'll, again, I'll steal Chris's, uh, some of Chris's thunder because he's way better presented than I am, um, and really talk about how it is to feel uh, or to train for what happens when you get punched in the face, and then you have to continue fighting. Uh, so that's, that's why we do red teaming. Now, Quickly, a question arises, why do red team at all? Well, first of all, it's not about compliance. All right? If you just want to be compliant, do some vulnerability assessment, you don't even need to do a pen testing. You do a glorified vulnerability assessment, 
that someone will sign off as a pen test and you'll be compliant, you're done. That's fine. Um, it is not about trying to bring the hackers to break into your shit because, again, that's not how an adversary would actually work. Okay, so that's not a that's not a driver, uh, and it really is kind of a continuum on the scale of vulnerability scanning, pen testing, and then red teaming. So it builds up on the company's maturity, security maturity, uh, that enables them to go from this level, which they usually do for compliance, and slowly turn up the volume as they progress, as they get more mature in their security practice, in their management, in their risk management, all the way up to red teaming, which is really what they need to handle as, as a company. Uh, and again, it's not about the compliance. If you just want to be compliant, find, find a big company that will stamp off your paperwork and, and you're fine. Another reason to do proper red teaming is to really kind of break out of the matrix, okay? And get out of that state of mind that security is about IT, because it's not. Some of the best red team engagements that I've had, a, had the opportunity to run weren't even run by the IT organization. They were run by the finance organization, the CFO, um, the audit, compliance, as weird as it sounds, uh, because compliance looks at it from, from a totally different perspective, sometimes even from the, the operations organization. And why it matters is because they understand that security is not an IT problem. Okay? IT is just a part of it. It's a part that should be easy to solve. It's a part that we're spending way too much time and money trying to come up with solutions to problems that we don't even care about because we're losing focus in terms of what a real attacker would do. So imagine that there is security outside of IT, take the red pill, dive in, and really discover what's, what's out there. So the next, next step in terms of, all right, I get it. Okay, I see why there's a need for a red team. How the fuck do I do that? Because you to just told me, don't look for the hackers, don't look inside of IT. How do I find that, that team that will actually execute the team part in, in red team? Well, it's really about assembling a group of people who are capable of executing this adversarial simulation. And again, you need to focus on the adversarial simulation part more than the, oh my god, you're such a cool lead Uber hacker. Okay? Because if you're just looking for the hackers, you're missing out a part of that you know, three-part three Venn diagram, and you're just not going to be able to execute the convert threat. So what do you look for on, on a red team composition? I usually like to, again, and, and you just focus on the three elements. So instead of just testing someone or assessing someone's ability to deal with Windows networking, pen testing, or with electronic locks, or uh, I don't know, with, with Cisco core router vulnerabilities, you are looking for skill sets that go across those three domains. So you just take the team and assess them on a scale in the different elements. So if Bob is really good on the physical part, all right, and can ha break locks and can bypass CCTVs and, and whatever, but is lacking on the social part, you need to complement that with someone else, with Joe, who's really good on the social engineering part, kind of okay-ish on the physical and really sucks at the electronic, and really build a team that the end result, the composition, contains all the elements that you're looking for for your specific adversarial simulation. And again, that composition will be different per organization. And the key for that is really understanding 
what kind of attackers are after you. So you need to go through that basic threat modeling um, exercise, which we do by default at any beginning of, of a red team, at which you are really analyzing what is this organization doing, right? How is the business run? What matters to this specific organization? Build a threat model around it. And, and again, I highly recommend you go and watch Wim's, Wim's talk on, on threat modeling a couple of hours from now. And based on that, understand what your adversary is after, what kind of skill sets do they need, then go back to that skills matrix and say, all right, so this, this is what my attacker would, would, would look like based on the threat model, based on my business. So this is the kind of team that I need to assemble that will simulate that kind of, those kind of attacks. So you really do need to do your homework properly. Uh, and again, I'm talking a lot about risk. Uh, you, you need to build a, a threat model. You need to understand that risk is not composed just of vulnerabilities. It is about the entire breadth of how do you manage risk. Uh, so you need to look at, at the threat event frequency. You need to look at the loss magnitude. What does it matter? Right? What if I pop your, your Linux box? Oh my god, yeah, you got a root. Who gives a fuck? If it's not business related, if it costs me nothing to just go, boop, there you go, new VM, fuck you. Pop that Linux box all you want. I don't, I don't care about it because it's not business critical. It's not part of my critical business assets. It, it doesn't even compute into my risk management. Go have fun. You just spend 40 hours on popping a Linux box that, that no one gives a shit about. So it's really about going for what matters. And, and this is what you'll end up after a proper threat model. You'll end up with a good understanding of what the core business assets are. And this is what you're going to go for. You don't care about that Linux box that, that you can pop left and right. You care about that Windows box somewhere that contains credit card numbers, that contains the, the secret juice that the organization runs on, and that if someone loses or deletes or sells, we're all out of job and probably in jail. So you really need to focus on going for, we call it go for the juggler, okay? What one hit that if I make that hit connect will punch you down and you're done. And again, it's not about, and I've shamelessly stolen this from my, from my Krav Maga instructor, um, who talks about martial arts. You know, a lot of people go and, and learn like karate and judo and stuff, stuff like that. And he goes like, oh, so you, get to, you, you go to dance class, right? Good for you. <laughs> How does that make you feel? Let me punch you in the throat, okay? And see what happens next with your fancy moves, all right? So it's, it's, it's not about practicing to look cool, all right? Or practicing just for the sake of practicing. It's about dealing with actual shit, all right? Someone's gonna pull a knife on you. How does your fancy karate moves work now? Uh, someone pulls a gun on someone else on a train. What are you gonna do? No. <laughs> all right, you take that gun away. You make them beg and you head off. Okay, it's about that first contact. It's about finishing what you started, and getting over with it. So we talked about the second rule, the, the first rule of going for a juggler. Second rule, give it all you've got. This is, this is not, again, we're past the point where we're turning on the volume slowly, all right? We're at 11, all right? We're past 10, we're at 11. When shit's gonna go down, it's for real, all right? There's no gradual, all right, there's no testing and kind of poking around to see, you know, are you awake, are you awake? No. You give it everything that you've got. All the ammo, one shot, because that's exactly how an attacker is gonna go. All right, they're not gonna poke you around for, for days and test vulnerability this, test, vulnerability, test that vulnerability. They're gonna coordinate everything and synchronize it so when they do go for the attack, it is going to succeed. And again, I'm quoting 
people that are smarter and, and more talented than me. And if, 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 there's a, if there are Israelis in the, in the crowd, they'll get this quote. Um, this, guy, this guy is being asked about how do you, how do you swim like a 100-meter sprint? And so his answer is, well, you start as fast as you can and then slowly speed up. All right, makes sense? So let's, let's we, we've covered the basic rules, all right? Go for the juggler and hit as hard as you can. Let's try to go back to this, this presentation's title uh, and paint by numbers. So my focus here is not about telling you the horror stories of, oh my God, look, look what I found. It's more about going back to those basics that threat modeling, that risk management that I talked about initially, and really see how a red team engagement affects a company and what the blue team does as part of that engagement and after that engagement to really make this worthwhile and not just a fancy exercise in, in look how cool I am. So first example, uh, we're, we're running an engagement with a big organization that went through a lot of M&As. They bought some companies, they sold some companies. There were a lot of personal changes, and new executive management, really key in terms of what they look for next, in terms of more M&A. So, so the, the HR was a big part of that organization's risk management. All right? Who, I mean, if the CEO now talks to some other company CEO, is he looking to acquire them? Is that a competitor? Is he looking for a way out because he's done with this company? That's, so those communications are, are a key part of what that, that organization is worth. So we started building, uh, building profiles for key, key people in that organization. Uh, and the profiles range from kidnapping profiles for you know, the CEO to kind of see what they're doing, all the way down to identifying patterns in communication, in movement, in physical locations, in flights of key executives to really track and, and you know, going back to, to metadata, right? What happens if that person and that person are in, in the same place for two hours in a restaurant and then they go back to their offices? They probably had a business meeting, right? What happens if this occur, occurs week after week after week in a pattern that didn't exist before, maybe there's something interesting brewing up. Uh, so we went for everything for, for uh, the home address, location, location history for the wife, the kids, uh, the whole thing, super interesting, uh, and really profiled that kind of behavior. Another thing that, that we noted was salaries. Salaries can tell you a lot about how an organization works, and if you try to pattern that over time, and figure out that, oh my God, they're, they're really dropping their salary range because they're hiring a lot of new people that are fresh out of college, that are super cheap, all right? And they're getting rid of the old timers who know a lot, of, a lot of stuff. And you can see that the retention rate starts to, to fall down. There's a problem there, all right? Maybe I can abuse that. So that kind of information, and again, this, this could be just part of the, the intelligence gathering of the red team. It, I haven't exploited anyone yet, all right? But just this part in the report, when I look at it from a red team versus blue team perspective, um, I've identified social, social weaknesses in that organization, all right? I've created key personnel profiles from a red team perspective and really simulated how an adversary would intel uh, uh, would gather intelligence on that organization. From a blue team perspective, again, it's not just about, oh my God, what did you just do? Did you really create a hijacking profile for my CEO? No, it's about identifying common public information, getting control of what am I leaking or what is my default posture as an organization, as a business, and what kind of information you can get on me without even you know, lifting a finger. I haven't even touched you. Uh, it's about training your key personnel for safety, for awareness, and going back to the CEO with, with the profile that contains his kids, his wife, where he went, 
really patterns of behavior over time, where are you going? It's not just about freaking them out. It's about making them understand that they are a key element of the, of the organization and someone will do that. And what are you going to do about it? Do you need executive protection? Because you're no longer, you know, in, in the minor leagues, you're playing with the big leagues and you might need executive protection. And it's really working with HR on social issues. Again, identifying that salary range starting to, to widen up. For, for a specific position. That means that you're creating a problem inside the organization, all right? Some people are getting paid a, lot, paid a lot, the people who worked there for like 15 years, but you're getting rid of them, bringing interns that don't cost much. You're creating some social issues inside. Uh, so again, from a blue team perspective, this is the key. It's about taking away the main elements of that Intel gathering and implementing them inside organization. Next example. That was one, that one was, was really hard to crack. Uh, we, we dealt with an organization that really had their shit together. I know it's not common, it's not sexy to say, you know, it was that I had a hard time running a red team. Uh, and I, I, we really couldn't come up with, with anything interesting on, on kind of the, the usual stuff. But then we went for supply chain because IT was really tight. I mean, they knew their shit. Everything was configured speak and span, encryption and not encoding, you know, all, all, the, all the fancy stuff. Uh, but then we went for supply chain and figured a problem in terms of how do they manage their supply chain. Uh, and we found an issue with shipping access points to remote locations, all right? Everything's pre-configured from the main office, everything gets shipped. Uh, but somewhere along the way, we managed to intercept that shipment and take hold of that access point. Or let's say walk into a conference room and just rip one from the wall. And the stuff that we found that we could do on an access point was just, just unbelievable. And, and again, thank you, Aruba. I don't know if you've dealt with these guys, but again, the products are, are awesome, but sometimes they're, huh, they forget some basic uh, stuff. So we managed to get access to, to an access point, ripped the firmware out, and found that there's, a, a, there's a, an option to backup configuration. You pull that backup, backup out, extract uh, the files, and you have the, the IK, um, IK shared password. Uh, you get the VPN configuration. So we can VPN into that organization just by breaking their supply chain management and all of that just by physically compromising an access point and extracting all that key information, all right? Super easy. So again, takeaway here, supply chain compromise. It's not about IT, okay? IT was solid. The blue team does not, it doesn't mean that the blue team just goes like, all right, I'm done. My work here is awesome. Call me when you have an issue. No, it's about going beyond that and understanding that you need to monitor other stuff, okay? And if I am able to VPN back into your organization, you should be able to say, no, that's not supposed to happen. You should be able to detect that because I'm sitting inside your, your corporate network. Um, you should look for role-based access control instead of just location-based. And really focus again on breaking that paradigm of everything's configured perfectly. All right? I had everything nailed down from a technical perspective. But somewhere along the way, there's something else. There's another element, again, physical comes into play, what happens if I lose an AP? What happens if my supply chain gets compromised? Next example. The sound man is probably going to coming over there in the back. Um, this was an engagement with a media organization. The guys that make the news and, and go on TV and stuff like that. <coughs> and, <coughs> sorry. We manage based on information that's just publicly leaking out. You know, uh, anchors tweeting photos of, of themselves before they go on air, 
And in the photo, you start seeing equipment in the back and IP addresses, okay, and hardware and software information um, that enabled us to focus on specific elements. I mean, getting into a news organization is not really a big problem because by definition, they're looking for information to come in, all right? So sending, you know, a Trojan PDF document to a, to a correspondent or to, to a researcher on, on the news team is really trivial. This is going to go click, 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 click. It doesn't open. Click, click, yeah. All right, if the story is good enough, they'll open anything that you want. The key is really going for critical assets inside and identifying those and going for this, again, DNF. This, this actually controls, um, you can see that uh, it, it, there's like a cameras and, and lighting. This controls the set, the studio, all right? And this is live on live TV. Um, we could go all the way up to a point where uh, we can control sound and PA inside a studio. Uh, one of my, one of my uh, red team guys were sending me an email. It's like, Ian, I'm gonna, hold, I'm gonna have my own reality show right now because I have control over the cameras in the studio and they're live. <laughs> he was freaking out. He's like, I don't know what I'm doing, but if I touch anything, <laughs> shit's gonna go down. <laughs> Um, again, and that equipment is the stuff that they use in production, okay? And the way we went for it is by understanding what goes where, connecting the dots of intel gathering and focusing on the actual assets inside and not just compromising, oh, I got, you know, I got the producer's laptop. Good for you. What are you going to do with that? What does it matter, all right? Um, so again, the key from, from the red team perspective here was understanding that there are new assets that the organization didn't even think about because, again, we were dealing with IT initially there, uh, and they're, fo they're all focused about the network, about like the Windows network and the shares and the database. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah I got it. It's, there's a lot of important stuff there, but we took a step back and we're like, but you're a news organization, all right? You're the media. What happens if your media does it MIDI anymore, all right? <laughs> what happens if I turn the cameras around, if I turn the lights on or off, or just cook the anchor? I mean, you can turn those lights up. It's going to be like the face of the sun there. Trust me, I've been there. <laughs> uh, it's about leveraging technical issues to affect the physical environment. Okay, we, later on, we simulated an event when they were, they were off the air to show them how we can affect the physical environment of the studio. So we managed to bring a guy into the studio that was not supposed to be there in effect using lighting and the cameras, which are all robotic, that physical environment, like move shit around. And he was pretending to be a technician of some sort. He's like, yeah, there's a problem with the studio's lighting. And just suddenly the lights just went up like boop, boop. It's like, oh, yeah, right, you're right. All right, so just connecting those pieces and enabling you to go further in that environment. Um, and, and again, it's, it's about combining those different elements into one engagement. From a blue team perspective, it was very simply extending that breadth of control because that specific organization had a problem. The IT, the security in there was just focused on IT. All right, they weren't looking at the big picture. And the CIO, the CEO, CFO, doesn't matter didn't really understand that security extends beyond patch your Windows boxes and have passwords. That's, by the way, that's their minimum requirement, have passwords. <laughs> uh, so it's going beyond that. It's, it's really recruiting stakeholders in the organization to understand, oh my God, you could have taken us offline, off the air. Now they were listening. Now it was not just a, some, some stupid technical issue that, the, you know, the, the weirdos from the security team handle. And again, it goes back to training and educating the business units, the, the, the people inside there to understand what's, what's the real effect. Next example. We were getting to some, some hard to access critical assets, all right? Again, in our organization uh, had some really interesting shit inside 
fairly secured. And, and we couldn't find a standard way to just access it and steal it and delete it and whatever we usually do on a red team. And, and again, we started thinking outside the box. We started thinking, so how do they manage that? What kind of access other than, you know, trying to open a shell or trying to open a, a, a VNC console into that uh, asset do they use? And lo and behold, we found, thanks to Dell, and uh, basically anyone else, I'm not just picking on Dell here, um, the off, out of band management for those, those pieces of equipment. Uh, and in, in this example, Again, we're, we're going for some, some hard to get databases and everything was locked down. And we started thinking organizationally, where does that data live? All right, what's the process? Where does it move after it gets created or modified? And we went for the backups. For some reason, the backups were not as well protected. And again, thanks to Dell, we managed to get full access to the robotic backup tape and just, oop, I want to restore that to somewhere else, okay? So while everyone is focusing on the big database here and securing it and you can't access and role-based access control and triggers all, and it's like a booby trap and whatever, we just went for the backup. It's like, oop, I get the whole tape of backups for, you know, the past three years. Let's see what's going on. So I, I'm not even triggering anything on their fancy, fancy detection systems where the database lives. I'm just going for a backup. And it's leisure. You know, it's tapes. They take time. But I got the same data. All right? And they forgot, quote unquote, to look at their threat model, at their risk management, and, and say, this is my asset. But guess what? This is my asset, too. It's being copied there all over over and over and again, uh, maybe I should look at the backups too. And again, just you know, pull that stuff out. We could even change the firmware on this one, which is just got it's kind of a you know a, you know those those criminals that live a a, a card. Um, so this is kind of our signature, changing the the firmware and leaving an now active logo and everything that we can <laughs> get our hands on. Um, so this, this was pretty bad. From, again, going past the, look how cool I am, um, from a Red Team perspective, getting access to assets out of their element, all right? Stop looking at the big booby-trapped database. Start thinking about the data itself. Where else does it live? And really focus on securing that and not securing the technical, easy-to-handle element but look for the business process. Uh, it's about really avoiding, you know, the big fort knocks of everything is, is, you know, cameras and robots and sharks with lasers. And look, well, w where else do you have that information? Because I can, you know, I could really use a break not handling with that, you know, James Bond shit. From a blue team perspective, super easy look where the data is at. Stop looking for the technical elements. Stop looking for technical solutions. Take a step back. Understand the process of where data lives in your organization and focus on the process. Stop focusing on the easy to solve problems uh, and really correlate those different alerts. Because that Dell machine was spitting out logs like crazy. I mean, we were all over it. We left footprints everywhere, OK? Uh, but if you start correlating that and understanding that those stupid logs that you've been ignoring for years actually correlate to critical data that you're really protecting very, very well on that end, maybe you should do something about it. I think this is the last example, uh, so bear with me. In this case, we're going for uh, stuff that wasn't even in production yet. Okay, um, so again, going for, for the organization, trying to figure out how they work, pretty mature. Again, most of the organizations that you'll, you'll run into, 
as a red teamer are usually, again, usually in a fairly good state of mind, security, uh, security uh, wise. Because they're mature enough to understand that they can go for a red team and not just vuln assessment and, and pen testing. Uh, so in this, in this example, we weren't going for the production. We understood how the process works of getting stuff from testing to qualifications to pre-production to production um, and found issues with how they manage the security of that process. So at this point, this, this is, again, this is us having root access to a sonic wall firewall that was about to get deployed in production. And at this point, we're creating, we are able to manage VPNs. So on top of the VPN that they do have, I can create another one for me. All right, and, and if this passed testing and no one really focuses, once, once they set it up, no one really looks at the configuration again to say, oh, we're about to go to production. Let's check it again. No, they're like, it works in testing. Let's copy that and move it to production. So that was pretty awesome because we were able to kind of root or, or backdoor that firewall before it went to production, sit down, wait for a week, a month, you know, three months, whatever it takes, and guess what? When it goes to production, I got VPN straight into your production environment. All right, so less work for me, which is always good, and more access, so game over. Red teamers, I just said that, all right? It, it's really focusing about accessing non-production. It's looking for the process of how do you manage your stuff, all right? And this could apply to anything. This could apply to, to R&D, to how do you develop your code, and you'll see a lot of abominations on that route. I mean, if, if you're dealing with, with a high turnover in terms of versions that go from dev to testing to production, and the, the process is not really nailed down, you'll see a lot of vulnerabilities just spewing out to production. If you can nail that process down and backdoor something there or change something in testing that just past testing is about to go to production and they're just going to tar it up and move it over, you're golden. From a blue team perspective, again, it's about the process. Okay? Your production environment can be super tight, um, but if the road to that production is scattered with vulnerabilities, someone's going to take advantage of that. And this is where you should focus your, your efforts. Again, it's thinking about the assets. It's thinking about how did they get there, all right? A database in production had to get there somehow, all right? Someone has a different version in testing. Is it sanitized? Is it different data? Are you pushing data back and forth? It's about thinking about that process. And again, and expanding the, the breadth of the security organization and the reach of it to other areas where it actually matters. All right, and spending that money where it would make an impact. Yeah, let's skip that. This is uh, less of an issue. So from, from a blue team, work perspective, the key to, to running red team engagements is not, all right, we'll, we'll just wait here and you'll attack us, you'll punch me in the face, I'm gonna die and cry and, and try to learn from it. No, the real process is being part of that red team engagement. Okay, not in a way that, oh, so tell me what you're gonna do next. No, it's about understanding that the process is not about looking for a specific vulnerability and exploiting it. That the process entails a lot of different elements. They're gonna come from different areas of social, physical, and electronic, and really being aware of what's happening right now. One of the great examples that I had working with a blue team in, in a red team engagement is when the blue team really has their shit together, 
and could identify spear phishing attempts working with their employees. So employee awareness was that high that I think like five or six emails in out of 10, within minutes, the security team was notif notified that something fishy is going on. Uh, they managed to trace back this email. And, and again, this, this was crafted by us. This was very, very specific to the region of the office that we're working, working with, uh, to the events that, that happened you know, the, the, the preceding couple of weeks. So everything was just nailed down. And we're like, we get like two clicks and that's it. And they didn't even install the, the thing. It's, it's weird. Um, so the Bluetooth was really on top of this. And, and again, understanding and really implementing, this wasn't their, this was not their first rodeo, right? This is like the second or third red team that we ran there. Uh, and at that point, it wasn't about the blue team like looking for shit. It was about having that awareness program really embedded into the employees and people raising flags by themselves, right? Not knowing that this is an exercise and everything working together and the back end. Again, within minutes, they had everything nailed down. They started, uh, they started incident response and forensics and, and traced this back. Um, they got back, they, they traced back the actual exploit that we're using, analyzed it, started reporting back. It was, it was beautiful just to watch. We owned in some, we, we, we then focused on something else because we had to, you know, we're getting paid. So, uh, but that, that was just, I mean, it almost made me cry. I was, it, it, I can get emotional about this shit. Um, again, quick response, minimize the damage. They worked by the book. All right, um, gain control over that, that whatever we hosted that phishing and, and really applied it back to the learning process beautifully. And this is really the key here. Again, it's the process is fun. You're going to have a lot of shells on a lot of shit that you didn't even know that existed. All right, you're going to fuck with people, you're going to break into stuff, take selfies in the data center, whatever it is. But at the end of the day, it's really coming back and seeing how you are affecting that organization as a whole and not just patch your shit. All right, a few words. I got like five or six minutes. Uh, so this is my trigger warning. Um, this is, this is going to get a little business-ish. Uh, because you know what? At the end of the day, someone's paying for this shit. And they're paying good money to get something out of it. So you need to understand that you are there to provide return on that big investment, okay? And that organization went past, again, they're at volume 11. They went past the pen testing bullshit. They're really looking for a change in terms of their posture and, and really seeing the investment reaping back uh, returns in terms of how, how well the blue team is doing from a maturity perspective, right? And, identi and seeing how it affects the three main elements of, of risk and how I manage the risk, which is people, processes, and technology. Breaking out of focusing the security budget on the technology and really seeing how it affects everything as a business that makes an impact, and that can be measured. And again, go back to business school or whatever it is, learn how to express those takeaways in terms that you can, you can monitor them over time, that's where you're gonna be successful, not in here's another shell, here's another box I popped, here's, you know, here's your broken lock, it doesn't worth anything. It's really going back to the business and saying, all right, here's how you guys are doing better. And having the CFO sit next to you and pull out the fancy you know, graphs and slides you know, with the lines and the bar charts and really backing you up in terms of how well are we doing, that's where you go and have your takeaway. Um, you're gonna have to do this again. 
And again, this is not a pen test, right? There's no retest button, right? There's no option to, oh, you, I, I got this vulnerability nailed down. Can you retest that? Well, no. Retesting is about going back to the threat model, understanding how things change now, okay? Because something changed in the organization. They fixed something, right? I need to understand how an attacker would now look at that and try to attack it, right? Because it's no longer the same, the same element. There's no click to retest button. Um, it's really retesting the core issue at hand. It's going for that asset, and if that path is now blocked, <clears throat> an attacker would look at another path. So that's the retest. Okay? Remember that. And again, at the end of the, the, end of the day, you're there to deliver successfully. All right? You're not, don't sell bullshit. Don't try to, you know, fancy it up, man up, you know, grow a pair of balls, learn how to do the business speak, because these are the people that you're going to deal with, right? Not the security geeks. And don't sell. All right? The sell is going to come in by itself. Learn how to express what you're doing in a coherent manner, as crazy as it, is, as it sounds, and it'll just happen by itself. Questions, comments, beer. Nothing. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, huge applause. <laughs>